Hi, everyone. So first, Nathan, I have to thank you. I guess he, he stepped off. So because anytime you can uh, sneak smoked meat into uh, a DevOps presentation, I kind of take that opportunity. So Nathan, uh, I know you love corned beef. I wanted to introduce you to pastrami. It's uh, corned beef, but with more magic. Uh, so uh, the, the, I put together a map. So next time you're in town, Nathan, you can uh, search best pastrami. Actually, my house comes up. Um, I also put it in a great pastrami and uh, hash with some fresh potatoes, and it's fantastic. So uh, uh, Nathan, you're invited next time you come in town. I look forward to it. All right, so um, as Nathan mentioned, Eric and I come from a background of uh, software engineering. Uh, but this presentation today uh, is not really focused on tools. It's really focused around process, people, organizational design, and culture. Uh, and one of the things over the last six years we've been doing is going through a, a continuous transformation to change basically how we develop and run software at CSG. And you can see those details on the left, and those are presented at DevOps Enterprise. Uh, but today, we're going to focus on just really three things. Our vision and what we call org shapes. The next thing is business metrics and culture. And Erica? So I'm going to spotlight a few specific teams as they've gone through their transformation. For those of you that are fairly far along in your journey, you may see some things that mirror your own experiences. And for those of you kind of just getting going, it'll give you an idea of things to come for you. Thank you. All right, so before we get started, I want to recognize one of my colleagues, Carter McHugh. Hopefully, um, you guys caught the presentation yesterday, if not later on the uh, video. But he did a fantastic presentation on how we're using Chef Compliance to basically get out of what, uh, what he calls compliance theater. Um, our, as you can see, our CISO really loved this. We took uh, some 20,000 hour effort to basically confirm compliance on our servers, reduced that by an order of magnitude. So um, it was a significant improvement in what we did with using Chef Compliance. So everyone congratulate Carter when you see him. Give him a round of applause. He did a great job. So really quickly, CSG North America. So we have a, a fairly traditional um, inf enterprise infrastructure. Um, I don't call it legacy. Uh, we have heritage. Um, we've got everything from mainframes uh, to you know, JavaScript written in, written in Node. So we really kind of cross um, all the technology stacks. Uh, but we've been very um, focused on continuous uh, improvement, continue, uh, adding um, basically velocity to the environment. You'll see how we did that in a minute. We support about 61 million subscribers in North America. So if you have some of the major cable providers, um, you actually use our software. We provide those SaaS-based services on the back end. So the first thing I want to go over is what um, we call org shapes and, and really vision. So we started out in 2012 with a traditional structure that looks very much like waterfall. Uh, we were focused and basically organized around resource efficiency. So really roles in specific groups um, that um, were very project centric. Uh, you probably recognize this model you know, before Agile. And um, one of the things we struggle with here is actually just development velocity and improving that. So we had a pretty bold vision. Um, as Barry Chris said the other day, we really had a relentless ambition to improve flow through the environment, really delight our employees and our customers, and really provide a secure and safe environment for both our employees and people and our customers. So we took that vision and really continued to progress along our path to improve those characteristics. So the next in, in 2012 was we applied a framework, and I've heard that several enterprises have, have done this and are trying to figure out. The framework we applied was safe. We injected lean thinking and also focused a lot on um, a lot of practices around software delivery, continuous integration, automation of testing, and those things, and we saw significant improvement in the development uh, environment. And uh, we really optimized then for what I call development efficiency. We did a great job and had some really great returns there, but we continued to struggle in the operational environment and basically having, um, the, basically having the type of reliability that we wanted. So in 2016, we had uh, a DevOps reorganization where we reorganized the teams to build and run the software. So brought together, basically, the resources that um, both build it and provide for the production operations, and they now reside on one team. And I really call this service orientation, where we are actually organized for what I call flow and knowledge efficiency. And this is where we are today, and we continue to improve from there. 
So there are a couple things we learned in this. One is, is what's also referenced in the Phoenix project is queues really don't scale. I also think of queues as really, uh, of really actually blocking information flow between teams. You put a task in a queue, someone else processes it, the request comes back and it's generally wrong and then you have to send it back again and you have what's called ticket hockey. Um, not only does it take a long time, but knowledge does not get transferred well there. When you organize a team around, that, uh, around delivering a service, they learn from each other. The second thing is basically when you put things in code, we know that's easy to share and it's easy to share at, at scale. So we know that knowledge and code both scale in the enterprise and that's what we're really focused on, on doing a lot, uh, across a lot of our activities. So the next thing I'll look at is what I call the business metric side. So executives love metrics. So um, I've done a lot of work over the years of doing this is really keep track of the metrics. One, where we are, what the value stream looks like, and then um, metrics around either flow, how long things take, but in this case, basically, these are quality metrics. So what, what we're looking at here is, is at the, the bottom red line, is basically um, incidents when we deliver a release. And we call it our release impact. And we started out before our agile transformation pretty high, around 500. That was about 50 incidents at a certain severity that got delivered into the operational environment. When we, when we introduced agile, what we found after doing that for a couple years and doing the automation, basically uh, shrinking our batch sizes, is that we improved that. Um, we improved basically what we're doing from release impact about um, 83%, so it's close to an order, um, order of magnitude. So we went and, and we averaged around 85 on the, on the releases now, and um, that's a significant improvement. We get four or five tickets to release when we drop the code, so that's significant for, um, for our clients. Above are the incidents that we experienced in production. You can see there where we bounced around at probably 1,600 or so incidents on average per month that are open in the environment. So in 16, when we introduced what we call the, the DevOps teams that build and run, they started improving the environment and you can see a dramatic drop from that, that peak of 1,600 incidents a month down to around 600. So that's a, a reasonable uh, improvement. And all of that is because of the changes uh, that we've made that put accountability and responsibility on the teams to basically actually run um, what they build. So that, that was a significant uh, improvement that we saw. So the final thing that I'm gonna talk about, which is incredibly important, is how you're involving all your people. Uh, in, DevOps in DevOps reorganizations and transformations, there's a ton of focus on engineering. Of course, it's development and operations basically need to improve the environment. But it really is so much more than that. What about all the other people that are involved in your value stream? What about security? What about product management, finance, help desk, sales, and HR? You need to involve them. So I'm gonna ask the quick question, how many folks from HR are here? Raise your hand, wave. One, two. We have two, Lisa, you have a partner. So this is, uh, this is the excellent Lisa McCary O'Neill. She, um, she works for um, CSG, uh, she's from HR, and she, I've and tried to involve her as much as I can in the DevOps transformation. Involve your HR folks, this is important. It's a cultural change in your organization. They can help you, they can help you figure out who to hire, they can help uh, understand how to work across groups. It's very important to involve them, and it's really about empathy across all these roles in the value stream. The other folks to involve, and, and uh, is anyone from product management here? How many product managers? I know Chef pro has a few product managers. Um, so product management, teach them about configuration management, teach them about operations, teach them what it takes to run your software so you don't have to have ambiguous questions about technical debt. So we've created a one team environment at CSG with our product management team where we have a shared vision across not just delivering features, but what we want operations to look like. We hire security experts into product management, we hire platform experts, we teach, we, we treat all of our technology like a product. And that was something that was brought up earlier from Adam, so I think was incredibly important, and that's how we view it. We don't view these things as projects that are ephemeral, we view them as products that we run for a long time and that we need to service and they need to be secure. Thank you. Now I'll turn to Erica. Thanks, Scott. So Scott's walked through some of the high-level uh, details around our journey. We've had a lot of successes along the way here, but we've also found that these successes can bring unexpected challenges, and our transformations are ongoing. So I mentioned at the beginning that I'd like to spotlight two specific teams. 
The theme that we've heard throughout the conference is do change, and these teams have been doing just that. So we want to talk about their journey, the successes, and the challenges that they've had along the way. So the first team that I'd like to talk about is the team that manages our load balancer. Historically, this team was very operationally focused, and they were immature from an adoption of DevOps standpoint. So what we did is we brought in developers and architects to this team, and we implemented dev best practices, so source control, continuous integration, automated testing, peer reviews, standards, these sorts of things. And then we completed a work tracking system overhaul, so we wanted to get all work visible, get it on one Kanban board, so we pulled from multiple systems, we got it out of emails, and then we used this as the foundation to make our agile improvements. We implemented and continue to expand on infrastructure as code, so this has been one of the, the largest and most impactful things for us. Deployments for this team were very manual in nature. Our largest change windows could take up to six hours in length. So obviously we didn't have a good repeatable way to test out in our lower environments, roll out to our production environments, roll back if we needed to. And this team makes a lot of changes, 20 to 30 production changes a week. So as you might imagine, success of changes, stability of the environment, these were issues for us. So what we did is we created this infrastructure as code framework. We've ported product by product into it, and we've got about 100 configurations here now. So with this, now we do have that button click ability to deploy to our QA environments, roll out to production in the same exact fashion, seamlessly roll back if we need to. Now we're all talking the same language. We're talking source code. We can take a look at it if we're making changes on behalf of other teams. Now again, we're, all, we're, we're talking that same language. We've integrated it with our logging and alerting platform. So now I can go in and I can see who's deployed what, when they did it. Overall, this has greatly increased the successes of our changes for us. It's been interesting. This is one of our early adopters of infrastructure as code. So there have been a few bumps along the way. One of the things that we found previously when we had production issues, once we knew what the issue was, we could pull up the UI and we could change it. And just like that, things were fixed. Once we put it in source code, it had to make its way through our build system. We had implemented some other processes. So we saw that we needed to have a way to streamline things when we were in an emergency situation. We had also developed some self-service capabilities, since things weren't in code, for teams to do some very basic things. After we rolled out infrastructure as code, they really held on to that self-service capability, and we let them keep it for a little while, and they they coexisted and they stomped on each other a little bit. Should have seen that in retrospect. Um, but it was another thing that we've learned and that we're now able to feed back into the enterprise as other teams continue to adopt infrastructure as code. We created a synthetics framework. So we've got a dashboard of about 1,000 endpoints. Every five minutes, we get system health information. And we use this to validate our changes. And then finally, we're evolving towards self-service. So we do not want to be a bottleneck, a central team that all changes are going to. Now that it's in code, teams can go and they can make changes there themselves. The next team that I'd like to talk about is the team that manages our monitoring and alerting platform. So this team's an interesting case. Historically, they were, they were actually much more mature with their DevOps adoption. However, they've experienced unprecedented growth those last couple of years, and the requests to get on the system have outpaced our ability to scale the system. So they've constantly operated very near capacity. And as soon as they make a change to increase capacity, it gets gobbled up by another team. And so we have been distracted by some stability issues. We've made some incremental changes, things like adding and separating infrastructure and software, very basic adding VMs, splitting out software components. We've improved the fault tolerance between our components, trying to remove the, the tight coupling there. Continue to partner with our third party vendors. Our operational footprint is ever changing, making sure that we're responding to that. And then improving visibility around system usage, getting telemetry on our telemetry system. Overall, though, we knew we needed to do something more impactful at some point. And we've done just that very recently. I'm very excited with the work that we've done to migrate to public cloud using infrastructure as code. So on May 11th, we moved all of our backend servers to AWS. And we did this with, uh, with Terraform and Chef to automate spinning up 40 servers here. Not only did we use Chef to spin up these servers, but we have over 1,400 inspect tests that basically verify for us that we're meeting our CIS hardening standards. This allows us to satisfy our PCI auditors as well as our internal security partners. So this is the first public cloud rollout of its kind for us, 
and we've really had a partnership together, lots of collaboration internally from platform, network, uh, security, and our DevOps teams. We've worked through issues like figuring out how to create a reusable machine image that meets security requirements, and also how to integrate with our on-prem server inventory tooling. This will serve as a blueprint for other teams that are moving out to the public cloud after us. It's allowed us to scale in a way that we just couldn't on-prem in the past. We have ever-increasing needs for storage and compute. The lead time and costs associated with those, we just didn't have the flexibility we needed. And now our patching story is much better. Patching was pretty painful before. It basically consisted of babysitting one server per night, and we had 15 different servers for this. Now we've got a modified blue-green approach, and this is largely automated. Overall, to recap, we've walked through our different DevOps journey changes, org shape, business metric, and Coltrix. We've, we've, uh, we've spotlighted a few specific teams. Looking forward, public and private cloud transformations are going to be a really big deal for us. We've laid a lot of the foundation here. We've got our chef infrastructure in place. We've got a team that, that can support this. We've laid out our policies and our standards. We've had our first public cloud rollout, and we have teams working on private cloud as well. So we really do expect to gain steam here and start seeing a lot of momentum around this. Work-life balance. This is feedback that we received from our teams through our transformation that we needed to have more focus here. So this year, we've dedicated 15% of teams' time to work on work-life balance initiatives. For one team, that might be fixing all those incidents that happen in the middle of the night so we don't get paged. Another team, it might be automating manual work. And then last, we're continuing to partner with our security and compliance teams, continuing to make them a part of everything that we do. Spread culture, invest in engineering, shift ops left. Thank you guys for your time. Scott and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. We hope you've shared our, uh, we hope you've enjoyed hearing about our, our transformation. Again, it's probably mirrored some of the journeys that some of you have, and we'll give you an idea of things to come.